Yes, we are live, Dr. Pat. Okay, hi everybody. And uh, we have our class here, the Hospitality Speaker Series class, and all of you in YouTube land and uh, welcome to our class today. This is, uh, we have actually, uh, it's, it's amazing how quickly the semester is going. Uh, we have only one have more um, class with, uh, with a guest speaker uh, and then, uh, and then after that, uh, we have another final class with me speaking. And um, so I think today is very special. Uh, I am so pleased to introduce Dick Rivera. Now, Dick's in San Francisco. No, he's not. He's in Sarasota. And I'm not in Montreux, Switzerland, although I, I like it in Montreux, Switzerland. I start using this picture to remind those of you who who can come on our summer program, which we won't offer this summer, but we will, God willing, in 2022, summer of 2022 in Europe, this too can be a place that you could see. So um, I wanna welcome Dick Rivera. I've known Dick for, for many years. Uh, Dick has uh, been uh, very active in the National Restaurant Association. Uh, you were president, I think, Dick, for- I was, I served a term, yeah. And, uh, and he was active at a time when the Restaurant Association really was in its heyday, and the students were a very big part of that whole thing that, that he and his cohorts were doing. And uh, Dick has uh, been to TGI Friday. Uh, Dick has had his own companies. He's got his other company now, which he, he started just, uh, not started, resurrected a couple of years ago. And we were part of that. Uh, he'll tell you about it. But with Bricks, we, we, had, the, we had the very the honor of being his test kitchen for a little while, a few weeks. So Dick is uh, a guy who really knows how to balance industry with work, with life. And um, we are very happy to, to be with him. We're very happy to have Dick on our board of advisors. You know, he's part of our 16 member board of advisors, uh, which we take very seriously and which we really need, not, not, just, for, not just for money. The dog, I'm sorry guys, hold on, let me, let me, let me just. <laughs> I got it. Uh, not just for money, but also for uh, for the wisdom and the talent that he gives us. So Dick's going to talk to you today. And he said, well, listen, what, is, is it just going to be a hot talking head? What are people going to think? I said, no, Dick, uh, I know you well, and you're going to you're going to enjoy this today. So he wants you to to, to put to ask your questions as he moves along and uh, rather than waiting till the end. So, Dick, we have uh, we have until. 145. Uh, I always think, well, we'll 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 end before them. We never do, and uh, <laughs> uh, so it'll be a good discussion. So, with that, I want to turn this over to Dick Rivera, and also I'll just remind you that Dr. Jihan Chabanoglu is uh, co-hosting this with me, and so Jihan will have questions coming in from uh, from the worldwide audience as well. So, Dick, it's all yours. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate it, and thanks to all of you for tuning in and. Uh, I really, as Pat said, I'd like to have this be more of a conversation than a lecture of any kind. And I thought one way to do that might be for me to talk a little bit about how I got in the business and some of my experiences as I progressed in my career um, and what I took away from and what I was able to learn as I went along uh, and then sort of wrap it up at the end with um, some major takeaways that I think you know, that I think about uh, even now as I'm starting new businesses, I reflect on uh, sort of what when, when I was doing well, what were the circumstances that were surrounding that? And when I was struggling in my career, what were the circumstances surrounding that? And uh, I feel like you can keep learning if you take the time to reflect a little bit. So what I'd like to do is use a little bit of time for me to reflect and uh, and talk a little bit about what I think I got out of it. And, and, and I'd love for you to ask questions as we go, if you have any, or make comments uh, so that uh, so we can really have an interactive conversation. But let me just start and I'll tell you that I, I began my career as what I would call an accidental restaurateur. I, uh, I got out of the army in 1970 and I went to Dallas, Texas because I'd had a lot of friends there when I was in college and I wanted to go to the University of Texas Law School. And so I got a job uh, working to become a resident of the state so I could go for the lower tuition because I was going to be on the GI Bill. And during that year, I made the decision I didn't really want to go to law school, which kind of put me at a loss because uh, that's all I'd ever really thought about doing. And uh, But I changed my mind 
and um, knew some people at a restaurant company called Steak and Ale, and I went to work there. And I, I would start by saying that I was really fortunate uh, that the people at Steak and Ale had about 16 restaurants at the time. Norman Brinker was the founder and the CEO. Um, and of course, he went on to uh, build some really big companies in the restaurant industry during his career. But I felt like uh, it really, being a young man and starting out there in, in an environment that was really focused on quality and doing things right and really focused on the guest and providing the right kind of experience was I, I couldn't have asked for more. It was um, it was a trying time because we were growing fast and all, although we were trying to do to have great systems and great training, we were in some cases outstripping our systems and so. It was a trying time in some ways, but always exciting, always challenging. And I think uh, the thing I took away from Norman and his team was that they were unwavering in uh, their insistent that insistence that character and integrity really count, that quality wins in the long run. And even though we had some really difficult times in the early 70s, you probably are not aware of this, but in the early 70s, we had the oil, or you might be, but you didn't live through it. Uh, in the early 70s, we had the oil embargo where sky, gas prices skyrocketed, long lines at the gas pump, cost of beef skyrocketed. And uh, Norman and the team were just steadfast and not lowering quality, uh, being clever about how to create value opportunities for the guests to keep them coming, but really being steadfast in terms of sticking to quality and, and, and staying the course. And it really, I think served as well. Now, the other thing about Norman, he was an Olympic athlete at one point and very much uh, convinced about teamwork and how it really powers an organization. And I think uh, uh, he was a believer in looking for the best in people uh, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. And I think that stuck with me uh, as well. The other thing that characterized him for all these things about character and quality and uh, what I call being generous in spirit and deed, giving people the benefit of the doubt, looking for the best in people. He was also very clear on expectations and he held people accountable. So it was a really great environment because um, it, was, it was high spirited. Uh, we felt like we were really working on great things and there was clear accountability. So you always had the feeling you knew how you were doing and you were getting good feedback on your performance. And so I think I couldn't have asked for a better place. I was there almost 10 years and it was a very supportive environment. I had the opportunity to go to a company called El Chico, which was a, a moderate size, 100, 100 restaurant, um, Mexican family dining restaurant, full service, alcohol at bars, but it was more family oriented, um, good price points. And I had a chance to go there as president. And I really wanted to just kind of test myself a little bit and see what I could do outside of that really supportive steak and ale environment. And so I went over there, it was a big turnaround uh, opportunity. They'd been struggling, it had been a family restaurant that was acquired by a baking company called Campbell Taggart. And, um, and they didn't really, they knew retail because from selling bread, they knew retail, but they didn't really understand the restaurant business. And so there was a big opportunity there. And I think um, kind of what I learned there, I was a very young man and I was full of myself. I'd had some pretty good success. And so I thought I really knew how to do things. And uh, and so what I learned there is you have to get to the root cause of what's really going on. Is it that the, is it that the business has become irrelevant? Is that why people are walking away from you, both um, guests in particular, but then employees too? Or is it that it's not being properly led? And I, I concluded in uh, Dallas, Texas, in the Southwest, Oklahoma, Louisiana, that was our trade area, that uh, it was really more a leadership issue and that we just needed to get back to the basics of leading people well and, and uh, executing properly in the restaurants. And we were making some ter terrific progress actually uh, in terms of building our average unit volumes and same store sales. Um, and then along comes Anheuser-Busch and made an offer to buy Campbell Taggart, our parent company. And the reason they wanted to do that is because they wanted to get in the snacks business. They were watching what Frito-Lay was doing and how their uh, snacks business was doing so well and they wanted to get into it. So they needed to buy a baking operation. So they bought Campbell Taggart and you can't own a wholesaler and a retailer of alcoholic beverages within the same company. So they had to sell El Chico. Well, being full of confidence and self-assured, I decided I wanted to buy it. The problem was I didn't have any money. So I had to go try and raise some money. 
And so I spent the next uh, 60 days, I would say one summer uh, in, uh, when was that? That would be in 1982, I think, uh, trying to raise money to buy the company. And it was a terrific experience. Fortunately, I didn't succeed because the last thing I needed to do was to be 33 years old with a ton of debt that I'd personally signed for and uh, being totally convinced that I knew all the answers, which I did not know. And I learned in the process how little I did know. And because uh, I knew about p &Ls, I knew about operations, but I didn't really understand about balance sheets and cash flow. I just it had not really been on my radar. So I, it was a, I, I always feel like I, I got my MBA in about two months time there in terms of talking to people and the kinds of questions they were asking me, the prospective investors. Um, the original family came back and bought the business. And one of the good things that came out of that uh, was that one of the bidders on the business was a company called W.R. Grace, who was big in the restaurant industry. And I got to know them in the process of their due diligence. And when they failed in their attempt to buy it, uh, they asked me to come help them run Del Taco, which was a fast food Mexican operation. And uh, it was in need of a major turnaround. They had bought the rights outside of California. They had grown it really fast, so fast that they had restaurants that they built, boarded up and didn't open because they didn't have management to run them. I mean, I know that sounds hard to believe, but that's what was going on. And, um, uh, and it was a great experience for me because I was working with some terrific people that I'd known before. Uh, we really had to get creative about, in fact, we called our company Creative Food and Fun. And the brands we operated with Del Taco. And then we acquired a business in West Texas that was a public company and was really sort of a backdoor way to become a public entity ourselves. Um, and then we were looking for alternative uses for the real estate. And we came across a little company in Atlanta, Georgia called TJ Applebee's uh, Libations and or something in Elixirs. I can't remember the original name of it. And this is a fellow named Bill Palmer, who had been a Burger King uh, regional vice president, who decided to do what he conceived of as adult fast food. And he bought some Wendy's and he put an atrium on them, put a bar in the middle and began selling really a sort of somewhat upscale version of Burger King food. And, uh, and they were really successful. They were doing well. And so we acquired them when they had two restaurants and we began to use some of our Del Taco properties to convert to Applebee's. That was the whole strategy. And of course the, um, the Applebee's part way overtook the Del Taco part and it really became an Applebee's company. So we began to grow it. And so I was there uh, as a president and chief operating officer uh, responsible for the Del Taco business and for the Applebee's business. And I think uh, that was my first introduction to franchising which was really fascinating and a real lesson for me because I quickly came to understand that you have franchisees and franchisors and they both have to be successful and that you really have two customers, if you will. One is the guest that walks in through the door to buy your product and the other is your franchisee and that they both have to be happy with what's going on if you're going to succeed. And so that was a, uh, that was a bit of an eye opener for me. And again, some of these things in retrospect, sound pretty basic, but it was a real, I think, turning point for me in terms of broadening my perspective and helping me understand sort of the various facets of the business. Um, one of our franchisees ended up buying Applebee's and I was asked to go to TGI Fridays first as the executive vice president of operations and then a year later as CEO. And Fridays was a fascinating, I still think it was probably one of the most fun things I've ever done. It was a fascinating business. It was a great consumer franchise, had great consumer acceptance, but it kind of lost its way. We had, uh, we'd had a long-term decline in same store sales and average unit volume. They had a, a strong culture, but uh, in my view, it was ill-defined and poorly thought through. So that if you went to, and the way that manifested itself was if you'd go, when I first started traveling, I could, one of the first things I did was go out and meet all the people in the field and travel to as many restaurants as I could, really the whole system. And, uh, and when you would talk to different general managers or regional managers and talk to them about the, we had what we called our Fridays myths and legends. And uh, uh, the myths were all stories about management and the uh, founder uh, was a terrific, was terrific at creating these stories that would illustrate principles. So 
we had the back dock theory, which had to do with discipline in the restaurant. We had the steel pole theory, which was about managing standards. And see, so this we had the beach ball. We had all these different management theories, and um, and they were really good. They made their points well, but but they hadn't been really specifically defined or followed up on very well. And so what you found is you went from one part of the country to another, so that everyone had their own interpretation as to what it meant. And so it wasn't a situation there about changing things very much. It was a situation there about clarifying and and sort of bringing everyone together around a common platform of what we wanted to do, what the, what we were trying to achieve, what the expectations were. And you'll hear a little bit of a theme now as I go on here because uh, it worked really well. Uh, it was enthusiastic. We did a bottoms up kind of approach. So we just kind of revisited the existing uh, Friday's culture and standards and performance metrics. And really from the bottom up, from restaurants, from servers, cooks, chefs, the managers, and then coming up the organization. So we really got, I think, a pretty deep uh, agreement on what it was that we were trying to do, what Friday's was all about, what the standards are that we're trying to accomplish. And, um, and it was amazing what happened. And it was really the power of the people and the power of the common vision, I think, that did it. Uh, and that sort of brought me to a point where I started to think that when you have a company that's in trouble, it's usually not the employees and the people in the restaurants that are the problem. It's usually the leadership. You just need to get, you know, get things clear and get out of their way and let them go do their work. And uh, that's a little simplistic, but at the same time, there's a kernel of truth in there, I think. So we were able to reverse the sales decline. We began to grow. We began to grow internationally, which was really uh, pretty exciting. We had one franchisee in, in England, and the company was the Whitbread Company, which was mainly beers and pubs, we had beer producer and pubs. Um, and they became the Friday's franchisee. And then off that base, we were able to grow in Asia, all over the rest of Europe and Russia. Uh, so it was really a pretty exciting time. Um, I left there in 94 to go to Longhorn Steakhouse, which was, a, again, my, as I think about this and as I was writing some notes to myself, I kind of went from one large organization to a small one. And it was almost as if I was looking to challenge myself to just see what else I could do. And of course, I saw opportunities there, too. And Longhorn um, was a small company founded by a fellow named George McCarroll, really good restaurateur. Um, they had had a period of growth and the, the founding story, if I had a little more time, I'd tell you about it. It's really amazing. Well, I'll tell you a brief part. He uh, wanted that he had been at Victoria Station, which was a really popular uh, steakhouse prime rib chain that was um, basically they were their whole shtick was they would had these railroad cars they would put together and you would dine in the railroad cars. But the real thing was they had great uh, prime rib. And it was hard to find really great prime rib at a decent price. And so they were very successful. When that beef crisis hit that I was talking to you about a little bit early, uh, earlier, the, the founders of Victoria Station took a little bit different uh, path and decided to uh, uh, buy no roll beef and, and lower the quality of what they were doing. And Vic Station started to struggle a little bit. And George was really disillusioned with that. He really believed in what they were doing and he was disillusioned to see them do it. So he decided he wanted to go open his own steakhouse in Atlanta. And he did. And uh, shortly after, he, he showed me one night the sales report for his very first day of being in business. They did $27 <laughs> in sales. I'm sure he wasn't laughing at the end of the night. But he said he looked in the mirror and he looked at this sales report and he wondered to himself what he had done. Anyway, uh, later in the month, there's a snowstorm, which is unusual in Atlanta. It gets cold, but they don't get too much snow. Well, most everything closed down, but George was determined to open up. So he put a uh, he put a sign out in front of the restaurant that said cocktails a dollar as long as the snow flies. And there was a famous writer, Louis Guizard, who came in from a place down the street because it was closed. The place he always went it was closed that day. And he came in, sat at the bar and started drinking the one dollar cocktails. And George said to him at one point, he said, uh, he said, Louis. He said, I'm loving that you're here and I'm really enjoying talking to you, but if you're going to drink all my whiskey for a dollar a drink, the least you can do is buy a steak. And so he did. And George went back, cooked the steak for him. <laughs> and anyway, Louis Grizzard wrote a column about it, about what a great experience he'd had, what an interesting guy George was, and the rest, as they say, is history, right? And the Longhorn Steakhouse uh, that you see today out there with some 600 or 700 restaurants was uh, the result of his $27 first day 
and his uh, taking care of Louis Grizzard on that snowy day in Atlanta in the winter. And, uh, but he had taken it public, stock had soared, they were doing really well. And then as things happened, they'd grown a little bit too fast. They missed their earnings, the stock crashed. And uh, I was at Friday's and he came to see me and asked me to come help him uh, sort of right the ship, if you will. And that was a really great challenge. I like George a lot. In fact, when I first moved to Atlanta, before, I, before my wife moved and before we got into a house, I stayed at his place. So I got to know him really well. And, um, and I think the, the challenge there was to bring some systems and some professionalism to the business uh, in what was a really entrepreneurial environment, uh, but keeping the, maintaining the soul of it, not losing the soul of the company, which was George's spirit. I mean, he had a great spirit of hospitality. He was really focused on serving great steaks and they were all hand cut managers, hand cut all the steaks. And um, we ultimately went away from that, but uh, we didn't go away from the managers really paying attention to what was going on with the food. And so uh, it was a great, it was really a great experience. It was very small, we had 27 restaurants at the time. And I went there because it offered a great opportunity. If, if we were able to turn it around, it was going to be a good opportunity for me. But I went there because I liked the small environment of it. I liked the entrepreneurial sort of atmosphere. I liked George. Uh, and so that brings me to um, this notion that I've had for a long time, and that is don't ever do anything just for the money. <laughs> do it because it means something to you, because you like the people, you respect the people you're working with. And, um, and I felt like that at Longhorn. We had a, we had a great relationship. Uh, we all felt like we were on a mission. Outback was growing fast. They had big volumes. And so we were gunning for Outback. And I'm proud to say today that Longhorn has as many restaurants as Outback. They do have higher average unit volumes. Not that we're competitive, or I don't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> and and it basically, the strategy that Longhorn has in place is what we put in place in 95. And I mean, of course, it's grown over the last 20 years and the menus changed a little bit. But it's basically the same restaurant that we created. Uh, back in 95. So it's one of the real sources of pride for me that we were able to take that and working together with George and some other great people there and really get it moving on the right path and then keep it going. Um, one of the things we did was building on the work that we did at Fridays when I talked about going from the bottom up and really clarifying what we were all about. We got a little more formal with it and created what we call the Longhorn Way, not the most inspirational of names, but uh, we were building on that work and again, starting from sort of a bottom up approach. We talked about what the strengths were, what are the great things about Longhorn, what are the things that we all admired, what are the things our guests liked, uh, what did our vendors like about it, what are the things they didn't like about it, you know, what did we think we needed to change. And we talked about uh, organizations that we admired and what it was that we admired about them. And from that, we basically put together really a, a way for us to build Longhorn into an organization that could be successful, that could thrive, uh, that could work for all of our constituents, for our employees, for our guests, for our vendors, for our investors, uh, and then we could all be proud of. And, um, and, and again, that was, a, that was a small company, so it was easier to do, uh, but we really worked hard on getting that deep into the DNA of the company to where uh, when I would go to restaurants and I'd talk to managers, I'd ask them about it. Not asking what they thought about it and how do we bring it to reality every day in the restaurant in our interactions with guests and our interactions with employees and uh, we did it I mean we got it pretty deep in the organization and I'm still they have a, a Facebook page for former employees of Longhorn and it's just kind of fun for me I don't post on it much but it's kind of fun for me to go read what people say about it and years later uh, it's really sort of rewarding to see employees talking about that time and what they felt they were able to accomplish and the kind of cultural change that took place. Um, and then I left Longhorn and went to Red Lobster, which was part of Darden Restaurants then. It's not anymore. Uh, and I went there because A, I wanted to be in Florida. B, it was by far the biggest company I'd ever worked with. And I thought it represented sort of a great challenge for me um, and, uh, and a new kind of challenge. And they'd had some, uh, some really difficult ways they had a 10-year guest count successive 10-year guest count decline uh, the year that i got there in 1997 we did two billion dollars in sales and made no money um, and so we were we were clearly at a point of time where uh, we were at a crossroads I and mean, we had to make a dramatic change um, or 
the company was going to be in trouble. I mean, it used to belong to General Mills. General Mills had spun it off in 94, maybe. I can't recall the exact year. So it was a freestanding public company now. And, uh, and it wasn't doing well. Olive Garden had been suffering a little bit too, but a fellow named Brad Bloom had come in there and he had it moving in the right path. And so our hope was that we could get both concepts, both big concepts sort of going on all cylinders at the same time. We knew we'd have something pretty powerful. So we went to work um, at Red Lobster. And again, I, I would say that the, I think the fundamental responsibility, or one of the fundamental responsibilities of leadership is really providing clear direction, having a vision of where you want to go and why, and then how are you going to get there and, and providing that clear direction. So we did what I think is probably uh, in the situations where I've been involved, the very best job of putting together sort of our Bible. We called it our compass because it was Red Lobster, Nautical, et cetera. And, uh, and it was a pretty clear description of what we wanted our employee journey, as we call it. Like if you're an employee at Red Lobster from the day from the day you're interviewed to the day you're to the day you leave, however long that may be, what is that? What should that journey look like in terms of what your experience is? And then we did the same thing for the guests. Uh, we, and and again, this was uh, we started with when I first got to Red Lobster. I went out and did regional meetings, and we would bring uh, servers in. We had servers that have been with the company 15, 20 years. Had seen everything. Had seen a lot of presidents come and go. And that, I tell you, there was definitely. There was definitely a feeling of this too shall pass, <laughs> that they were going to outlast me, you know. And, uh, but we went out and we talked to our people from the heart of the house. We talked to prep people, cooks. We talked to servers. We talked to bartenders. And then started working our way up the management team. And, um, and finally got to the executive team and said, okay, here's what we've heard from the employees. We had 650 restaurants more or less of some 300,000 employees. Uh, in Darden overall, um, at uh, Red Lobster, probably something like 40,000. And um, um, and so I said, here, we distilled it down. We said, here's what we've heard. And we went through that same kind of exercise, really trying to figure out, and there's a reason I'm telling you all this, so kind of stay with me. But my friends say, Dick, you have to let people know that there really is a point to what you're saying. <laughs> I do. There's a reason I'm telling you all this, but it's because it's about sort of taking the time to reflect on who you are and what you want to be and what that's going to look like and then being fairly specific about um, what are the metrics that you're going to use. So we went through and we talked about our values. What are the things that are just to us um, so fundamental to, our, to the DNA of the concept and to the people there? Uh, so hospitality was one of them. Quality was another. Integrity was another. Um, and then we talked about, uh, so what are the principles that are going to guide our behavior and our decision making? And then we said, um, based on all that, then what are the promises that we're willing to make? You know, that if we have these values and we're going to live by these principles, and what are we willing to say to our employees? And you can count on us for that. So an example of the promise, one of the promises was um, total preparation. That, you know, so it's all about training and preparing and communicating clearly. It was about, another one was about feedback. Um, and so we just kind of made these prom we had promises that we made to the guest. <clears throat> so we worked our way through it and then we had to implement and it took us, um, well, it took us the rest of the time. I was actually at Red Lobster four years before I went to work sort of at the Darden level. Um, but we went to work sort of changing our work processes. So our evaluations, for example, our performance reviews were tied to the compass and were we delivering against our promises and to find that out we started doing surveys with our employees and 360 degree um, surveys where the people that work for you and the people to whom you reported and the people who were your peers would all evaluate you based on things that we set in our compass and uh, we call that the leader meter <laughs> so we developed a bit of our own vocabulary you know and I'll tell you, it took, at first, there was a little bit of skepticism. There'd been a lot of turnover in the CEO role, the president role. And there was a little skepticism. But as we went through it, people really started to accept it. And I'll never forget, I was up in um, Tampa at our restaurant near Bush Gardens, which is a really high volume restaurant. It was then. I don't know if it is now, but I assume it is. Well, not today, maybe, but generally. Um, and I was back in the back dock with the kitchen manager. And he said, you know, I got to tell you, he said, when this compass came out, I read it 
And I said, what is this all about? What's this guy talking about? You know, I just, I said, okay, fine. So now it's been a year and a half and every meeting we had, we would talk about it. We'd talk about the principles. We'd talk about how you put them into action in your everyday work. Um, he said, now I've really gotten to know it. I see it working in the restaurant. You know what? He said, I use it sometimes at home with my kids and with my wife. And when, <laughs> when he said that, I'll tell you another story. I was, the way I learned it, I told my guys, I said, one of the things you need to do is you need to learn this, every word. It was long too, it was long. So you need to learn every word by heart. And they looked at me kind of crazy. And I said, because the way you internalize something is you have to know it here first. And then, then you start behaving it and you internalize it into your heart where it starts coming to you naturally. And so I would do it when I was walking on the treadmill in the morning, my wife had two treadmills and she'd walk alongside me and I would read it out loud. That's how I was gonna memorize it. So one day after we're through working out, we're having a cup of coffee and she says to me, you know, that compass sounds pretty good. Is there a domestic version of that? Because <laughs> it was all about treating people for, with respect, you know, <laughs> communicating clearly, giving good feedback. I thought, that, well, I thought it was really funny. I guess you guys didn't think it was quite so funny. But the point being, when I heard that kitchen manager, assistant kitchen manager, to tell me that he was thinking, he was using it in his home, I said, okay, now we're getting somewhere. And this thing is really getting deep into the organization. And I felt like you could see the transformation start to come to Red Lobster. We had, uh, I got there in 97. The fellow who was my chief marketing officer, uh, is now the CEO of Chili's. And he came to me early in 98 and said, there's going to be a record crab season this year in Alaska. And he said, I think we ought to do an all-you-can-eat crab promotion to really get our guest counts moving. And so we walked, I was, it scared me to death, to tell you the truth. But he walked me through the cost implications of it and what he thought we would consume, et cetera, et cetera. And he had really thought it through. We decided to do it. And it just took off like crazy and we never looked back. Our sales uh, went up and they stayed up. Um, and it was really uh, an amazing thing to see in terms of what it did for the spirit of the organization. Um, so it was a great experience. I'm gonna stop there with all that because I'm starting to reminisce now, that's not good. But I think, um, uh, I think the point of all that is about the clarity of direction, about the specificity of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, so in 90, in 2001, so I've been there four years, I guess, running Red Lobster with my team, and uh, I became COO of Darden, which is a big change, because I went from sort of leading a restaurant concept to leading presidents of restaurant concepts. And um, uh, it was a real transformation for me. I mean, I, it was, and it was not easy, actually, you know, because I, I, um, I didn't want to give up running the business, <laughs> so to speak. And of course, as a COO, you don't really give it up. You just have to do it really differently. Um, and so one of the things, that was a really interesting thing for me. And frankly, uh, at the end of the day, by 2004, I decided it really wasn't for me. I didn't feel like I was in the restaurant business anymore. I felt like I was in more of an administrative role. And uh, it just didn't feel right for me. And so in 2004, I, I started what I laughingly call my, or what my wife laughingly calls my retirement years. Uh, I left Darden in January of uh, 2004, and in November of 2004, we opened our first Marlowe's Tavern. I say we had two partners uh, that helped help me, or the three of us kind of did it together, and uh, it's an Atlanta-based startup. We were wanting to establish um, what we thought was the 21st century equivalent of the traditional American tavern from the 19th, from the 18th and 19th centuries, um, where you know, people gathered in taverns for food and drink, for sure, but also for conversation and for camaraderie. And uh, one of our early Zagat ratings um, described us as an upscale cheers. And I think that probably really captures it. I wasn't crazy about using a derivative term like that, but a lot of times I'll try and explain what Marlowe's is and people sort of nod their head and then I'll say upscale cheers and go, oh yeah, right, that's great. So it works. <laughs> Uh, so we did that and we walked through and created our Marlowe's magic. So I won't take you through all that, but basically it was the same idea as the Friday's way, the Longhorn way, the compass and Marlowe's magic. Except this time we did it before we even opened the door for the first time. And, uh, and I have to say, I think if you went and we do surveys every year with our employees, we do 
uh, a lot of, I think, follow up to be sure that we're living it. And I have to say, we've probably done the best job uh, with Marla's that we ever have, that I ever have. Uh, it was tough in the first couple of years. It was really an interesting transition for me personally to go from being at a big company like Darden to having one tavern in Atlanta. And, um, and we made a lot of missteps uh, because we just had to rethink it, you know, about what's this all about. And, and living with limited resources uh, was, a, um, was sort of a new experience in a way it was like going back to the very start when I first began as a general manager. And, um, and so I think in that regard, it was a great and humbling experience uh, because we really struggled for two, three years. We had one that, was, that, that we thought was gonna be an absolute home run. It wasn't, it is today, by the way, interestingly, it's grown into it. Uh, the second one, we didn't know what it was gonna do and it took off like a rocket right from the beginning. In fact, if it hadn't, we might've had a different outcome altogether. But anyway, uh, we finally got traction and in the two to three year time frame, I think we learned some things about being more disciplined, about executing better, about marketing uh, more effectively. And we began to see same store sales growth and we began to open more taverns. And today we have 23 uh, between Atlanta, Tampa and Orlando. And then after years of um, not wanting to do business in Sarasota, I always thought about Sarasota as my getaway and I didn't want to have to come to work here. But then as I began to travel less. I just got a little restless. And so three years ago, I opened Brick Smoke Meats on State Street, which is a Florida influenced um, Central Texas barbecue place with um, barbecue and I would say just Texas cuisine. I mean, so in Austin, it's based really on the food you would find in Austin, Texas. And in Austin, Texas, if you're not eating barbecue, generally you're eating Mexican food and drinking margaritas. So you'd find uh, tacos on the menu, a pretty active bar, and then of course the smoked meats, hand cut steaks. Uh, so it's a bit, and then some fish out of items. So it's sort of a, we've incorporated a little bit of Southern cuisine to it. And uh, that's another one that uh, took, it took a while to get going, but now we're seeing some pretty good results. Uh, and then in March, um, we opened a Classico Italian chop house at the corner of Maine and Palm Avenue. And it's basically pizza, pastas, uh, steaks and chops in a fifties, this is the way I think of 50s supper club environment with a rat pack vibe. So you'd hear Frank Sinatra and the music and that we have entertainment, we have a piano bar, not a piano bar, literally we have a piano in the bar. And, uh, and it's, gone, uh, it's gone surprisingly well considering what's going on. And so uh, we, we bought it on the second, we had to close on the 17th. We had in mind to do some remodeling anyway. So we took advantage of the closed down time to do the remodeling. It was not easy because we couldn't get a lot of people to work, but we were able to get it done. Then we reopened and it's doing, um, it's doing well. So it's kind of my um, restaurant work. Um, Pat mentioned the NRA board service and serving as chair of the board, uh, president of the chair of the board actually. Um, and that was a fascinating experience. I spent 10 years as, on the board and it was a great opportunity to make some friends, to meet people, to understand the breadth of the industry, to see um, the opportunities that, that are out there and how different people take advantage of them. And to do some really good work with the National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation, um, really helping with a scholarship program and different, and helping kids, I say kids, helping students, uh, uh, helping students get an exposure to the business through the restaurant show and some of the things we did bringing them to Chicago and getting them to interact with restaurant tours and to get out and about and so uh, that was pretty gratifying work actually and it gave me a real respect for operators in general uh, just to see you know whether it's single store operators or regional operators uh, it really was a great opportunity for me to get out and about and see what's going on in the industry. Uh, the other thing is, um, as a great learning opportunity, it may sound funny, but the Great Recession that started in 2008 that caught us all by surprise. One of the things that was interesting was Marlowe's, maybe because we're neighborhood places, uh, maybe because in recessions, people tend to drink a little more. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, but our sales really took off. And so during a time, 2008, 9, 10, and 11, when casual dining restaurants uh, were really suffering, we were having double digit sales increases. And so the lesson there, I think, is 
someone in the crisis is always going to be doing well. The industry is big enough, and the segment even casual dining is big enough that even though the news, the general news may not be good, there are going to be people in it who are succeeding. And I think that's where you need to look. So, for example, if you look today, um, Texas Roadhouse uh, is doing really well. They're back to their full sales that they were doing last year. In fact, they're up over their sales last year. Uh, there aren't a lot. Olive Garden's doing well. Um, and so you can look and see who's doing well and what are they doing that's enabling them. Of course, in the fast food uh, sector, there are a lot of people doing really well. Panera's doing well. A lot of the drive through places are doing well. Pizza places are doing well because of delivery. And so it's an interesting thing because it's easy sometimes to fall into, well, there's a recession going on, so it's really hard to, to make progress. But uh, if you look deep enough, you find that people are, some people are making progress so you can go to school on them. Uh, and then COVID-19 has been, uh, you know, life and industry changing in a lot of ways. Uh, for us, it required uh, a really quick response uh, because we went from doing business to having no business and virtually from one day to the next uh, and some really tough decisions. And we had people who've been working with us a long time that we had to furlough and we had to move fast. We didn't really, um, we didn't have time to sort of wring our hands. We had to decide what we're going to do. It took a really disciplined approach. I mean, watching every penny, a lot of great communication with our vendors. Uh, we were talking to them every week about where we were. Um, it was about cash conservation. I mean, one of the results was uh, that we talked to our, our primary vendors on the food side, U.S. Food Service. Uh, and we just told them, I said, we, you know, we're not we're not we're going to stay current, but we're not going to pay you what we owe you. And I said, and then we're going to start working it down as we have cash. And because we went right to them and we were straightforward and we would pay them for all the current things we were buying. And then we slowly started paying down what we owed them. They said, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Just as long as you keep some money coming <laughs> to, to work it down. So by the end of this year, we'll have them totally paid off. We will have been current on everything we're buying. And, uh, but during the period that we were closed, when we were just doing to go, we were only paying them for what we were selling them to go. And the lesson there, I think, is that People will work with you if you're upfront and you communicate quickly and they know that you're, they know you're honest about it. You're sincere, you know, because they, they knew, I mean, you know, that's what they do is service restaurants and hospitality. They knew everybody was hurting. And so that was a, it was good to see, you know, that we had the kind of relationship uh, with them that they would work with us, you know? And uh, so it required a really disciplined approach. It required being really tough minded about cash conservation um, and, uh, and some flexibility thinking about how you're going to do things. Uh, within all that, you know, our to-go business uh, went from being about 4% of our sales to being about 20% of our sales now that we're reopened. And, um, uh, and so now we're trying to find ways to hang on to that so that as the dine-in business comes back, we don't lose that. So it really becomes incremental. And so the whole uh, COVID-19, as much of a tragedy as it has been, I think we've learned some good things that are going to stand us in good stead next year whenever we get back to a more normal environment, you know, in terms of how quickly we can respond, the fact that we can really be disciplined. We found ways to get more productivity out of our taverns. Uh, so it's really so it's really been, in a lot of ways, a learning experience that will be valuable to us down the road. I wouldn't I wouldn't look to put an enemy through the experience, but having to go through it, you may as well learn something from it, right? So so here, let me just kind of get to a couple of takeaways that if I had to leave a few thoughts with you, here's the ones I would leave. Uh, that character and integrity uh, really do count. And Peter Drucker, who's one of my favorite business authors, uh, said that character and integrity in and of themselves do not accomplish anything. So simply being a person of character and integrity does not guarantee you're gonna be successful. But the absence of them faults all else and is a disqualifier. And I really, in my almost 50 years now of experience, have come to believe that that's really true. When you see people, not everyone that's a person of character or integrity is successful, but very few who are not are successful over any kind of period of time. Um, the second thing is uh, this whole notion of, and when I talk about our compass and the Longhorn Way and the Marlowe's magic, I said, take the time to think through who you wanna be and what you wanna accomplish. 
And now is a great, this is a great opportunity for you to be doing that because you've got exposure, you're learning every day. And, and, and I would just say, take the time, you know, to really kind of think that through. And Stephen Covey, another one of my favorites, uh, said that you should begin with the end in mind. And I think that's a good way to think about it too. And think about what do you want your legacy to be as a leader? What do you want it to be as a person? And at some point as a dad, as a husband or wife, as a spouse. Um, and so take the time to think through what you want to be and how you want to get there and what you want to accomplish. So you can't have a great enterprise without great people. I mean, anytime when I think about times when I've been really successful, it's because I had great people around me. When I think about times that I've struggled, it's because I waited too long on making people decisions. One of the reasons I had a guy tell me a long time ago, when I first became CEO of Fridays, my first job as a CEO, really. And it was a public company at the time. He came out to see me. He was a recruiter, executive recruiter. And he said, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of CEOs succeed and I've seen some fail. And almost inevitably when they fail, it's because they don't make people decisions in a timely way. He said, so my advice to you as I'm leaving you today is make the call or you'll take the fall. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was in 1989, 88. And I never, never forgot it. It doesn't mean I've always done it, but I never forgot it. So you can't have a great enterprise without great people. So hire the right people, set high standards, provide clarity and direction on expectations. Uh, and then uh, when we went to Longhorn, we had a, early on, we had a meeting and I said this and I almost immediately regretted it, but then I came to be okay with it. I said, we're going on a long journey. We're gonna carry the wounded and we're gonna shoot the stragglers. And <laughs> what I meant was if someone's got the right frame of mind, and they're working with it and they just haven't got it yet. They're having trouble getting with the program, but they're trying and they're working on it. You carry the wounded, you help them on, you know, give them extra training, you help spend time with them. Someone's digging their heels in and uh, passively, aggressively fighting what you're trying to do, take them out by the dumpster and say goodbye. And so uh, uh, I just, that stuck with me as well. My, my vice president of human resources, by the way, when we walked out of that meeting, said, Dick, maybe you ought to tone that down a little bit. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the last thing I would say to you, I think it's the last note, next, the, the penultimate, is at the end of the day, Peter Drucker said this too, at the end of the day, your goals have to degenerate into work. And so you got to do the work. And the work is, I think you got to prepare. You got to take the time to really get yourself ready. When I when, again, when I find that I've done things well, it's because I took the time to prepare. And when I kind of struggled is when I thought I could shoot from the hip. And so do your work, do the, the preparation and uh, focus on contribution. It's easy to get caught up in political things or side issues, but focus on contribution. How can you add to what's trying to be accomplished? What is it that you bring to it that nobody else can bring to it? Uh, and then show up every day and give your best. I mean, I think a question you can ask yourself is how would the person I want to be do what I'm about to do? How would the person I want to be do it? So whether you're giving a performance appraisal, whether you're uh, dealing with a guest, you know, whatever the case might be, if you kind of hold that for yourself, thinking, having thought through the kind of person you want to be and what you want to accomplish and what you want your legacy to be, say, how would the person I want to be do this, you know? And then uh, make reflection and thinking part of your routine. I would say at least weekly. Take the time to reflect on what you've been able to accomplish over the course of the past week or two and what you want to accomplish over the course of the next week or two. And the reason I say that is all business is probably this way, but the restaurant business is for sure. Uh, that you've got from the moment you walk in the property, you've got a crush of events coming at you. And I often would say to our guys, it's like swimming against the current. You know, if you miss a stroke, you lose 10 feet. And, you know, you've got people calling off. You've got vendors coming in right in the middle of your business. You've got all kinds of things trying to tear you away from what your priorities are and your objectives are. And so I think it's important to take time to reflect. What was I able to do last week? What am I going to work on this coming week? And make sure that's top of mind uh, as you go in every day so you can stay focused on it. So that's a little bit of reflection on highlights and things I think I've learned from it. And I'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions. Well, Dick, you, again, uh, you, you just got it all covered, including, uh, including COVID. Well, let's just open it up to the students in the class first, and we'll give priority to Group A because uh, you're on deck. Uh, so take it away, Group A. 
I got a question. Um, you guys, I think you said you bought the restaurant Classico. It was Red Classico. Um, right. Are you going to continue like the nightclub part of it where at, I don't know, at like 10 or 11 o'clock, they reopened as a, as just a bar and a dance scene? So, of course, we can't do that now. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting part of the business, and it's one that we're debating right now because there's obviously the, the positives are you love doing the business. It's pretty profitable business, uh, and it draws a different crowd than your dinner crowd. So you're really broadening your reach, and, and you're expanding your, your brand, if you will. Uh, those are all the positives. Uh, there aren't too many negatives. One's it's hard on the it's hard on the business. It's hard on mm -hmm. the managers. Hard on the business. Can be a little confusing to people. Are you a bar? Are you a restaurant? But there aren't a lot of negatives. My guess is that we'll at least do some version of that. If not, they're really full blown. I was, I'll say this: uh, we bought it. I think on the second of March we closed, and on the first Saturday after that. Um, I had to take my dog for a walk and I said to my wife, I said, let's walk down there. We live two blocks away. I said, let's walk down there and we'll sit outside, have a drink and see what's going on. And so we got there about 10, maybe 9.30, 9.45. And uh, we were somewhat busy, you know, activity Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And by 10.15 or 10.30, people start showing up dressed to the nines. I mean, and young people, not, not you don't, you know, it might, well, of course I'm in bed usually by 10 o'clock, so I wouldn't see it anyway, but but uh, I just, you know, it's a whole different crowd that uh, I'm not used to seeing and really well, yeah. well, well dressed, well presented. And um, and so uh, I said, wow, look what we have here. And by the time I left, my wife took the dog home. I stayed for a minute. By the time I left about midnight, you couldn't even move on the floor. I mean, people are up dancing and having a great time. So there's a part of that that really appeals to me. And uh, and we're kind of working our way through it. I think it's a moot point probably for the next three to six months until we get past this COVID business. Uh, but but I would like to have a place. There are not many places like that in Sarasota. I'd like to have a place where you could do that. It was, um, that's basically when uh, the Christmas break or spring break or anything like that, it's basically a high school reunion for anyone who went to school around here. I Every time I go in there at uh, around 12 o'clock, I see at least 40 people that I've seen, you know, I, I know, so. Oh, wow, that's great. That's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah. It's an interesting feeling going into that restaurant late at night. Have you been oh, in recently? Go ahead. I haven't I haven't been there recently. Um I did go there probably seven or eight months ago for the first time for lunch and it was pretty good. I liked it. Yeah. So we've yeah. changed it a little bit. I'd be get I'm curious to get your feedback. Yeah. That's good. I, I'll, well, I'll it's check good to have your, your local eyes for us to look for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and uh, another another person from the A group before we open up YouTube. Sid, go ahead. I wanted to ask, uh, what made you want to go in the direction of bringing uh, the cuisine of Austin, Texas, to Sarasota? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'd, I'd love to have a really strategic response for you, saying I analyzed the market and I saw the need and all that, but. I was going to the market, the Saturday farmer's market, and there was a fellow there who was selling barbecue, Central Texas style barbecue. And I started buying from him and really liked it. Uh, got to talking to him and he said he would like to have a restaurant. And um, he, he would talk to me from time to time about different partnership deals he was considering. None of them worked out. And when he told me about the third time, uh, I said, well, why don't you and I do something together? Because I'd gotten to like him, I loved his barbecue. And so we expanded the concept from being a farmer's market sort of kiosk offering uh, to a full restaurant. And the inspiration for it was a place in Chicago. Uh, there was, that, so we went and we started doing our due diligence. You know, we traveled to Texas, went to Chicago, look, looking at different barbecue ideas and restaurant ideas. We couldn't decide if we wanted it to be fast casual or full service or whatever. And we walked into this place in Chicago and really liked it. And we came back on a Friday night, about seven o'clock at night. It was packed. And, uh, and so we went to the bar and got a stool and waited just to, and watched to see what was going on. And they were packed till 11 o'clock at night. And we finally went and got some food. And, uh, and I said, I think this is it. We just need to bring this to Sarasota. And so, you know, Chicago is a very different market. Um, and so we did some things a little bit differently, but that was really the inspiration for it. 
uh, and going to Texas. I mean, there's, a, there's something really special about Central Texas barbecue and that whole barbecue culture that's about community. It's about getting together in the backyard and one guy is smoking the meat starts out at six in the morning. Somebody else brings the beer and then by four o'clock in the afternoon, everybody's gathered around a picnic table telling stories, drinking beer and eating barbecue. And, uh, and so it would be great if we could create something like, we wanted to do something different uh, that's not available downtown. Of course, Nancy's is there, but it's not exactly what we're doing. I mean, we're full service, full bar. So anyway, that's how it happened. Yeah. Dick, what was the name of the place in Chicago? Do you remember that you that inspired you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think. Of it. I think it was called Green Street. Green Street. Uh, I can't recall. Did, did yeah. they have like long tables and stuff in there? Picnic, big picnic tables. Yeah, I, and it was a I real an old industrial space. And yeah. they didn't fix it up. I mean, yeah. I, I thought it was a little rough to bring the exact same thing. I may have been wrong. But I, I thought it'd be a little rough for our Sarasota crowd downtown. And so we dressed <laughs> it up, but, you know, but uh, I, I may, you know, people may have loved it. But anyway, people like the atmosphere there at Bricks and they like the food. So we're doing all right. And yeah. I can tell you that uh, some of our students uh, had the opportunity and the, and the gift of being part of the planning. Dick really took the planning quite seriously on opening the restaurant. They tested all their recipes at the, at the Culinary Innovation Lab that we have in Lakewood Ranch. With the exception of the barbecue itself, they, they had to wait for the oven for the pit to get for the in. smoker. Yeah, so yeah, that was really, yeah, that was really good. funny because coming from Darden, you know, I had this from big companies, but particularly Darden, um, we would test everything to death, and uh, and so here we are. We had no kitchen, uh, and so we had to beg, borrow, and steal. And so we had uh, the guy that sold us our Perlick beer equipment up in Tampa. We went up and used their kitchen. Uh, we would just going around and finally I, I met with Pat and I said can we use your kitchen out there and so he was uh, very kind to let me use it with a small donation <laughs> <laughs> well I'm a, I'm a professor yes. you know but anyway uh, well you know we had to look out for the school too you know so uh, anyway uh, it was really great because it gave us a chance to uh, and we uh, Mark the guy that did the farmer's market brought a portable smoker and we had it out in the back in the parking lot and we were smoking the meat there and then bringing it in and so we did a lot of testing ourselves in development. And then we brought people in and did like focus groups, testing the food and having them evaluated. It was really helpful uh, because we got some affirmation of some things that we liked. So we knew it wasn't just our opinion. Uh, and then we got some really good feedback saying, I don't think this is, this is going to work, you know? And so it really helped us. Yeah. And I think, uh, frankly, I think the barbecue has been good from day one and our guys have done a good job of keeping the standards up. It is. And the service, the service is, is very warm there too. And that's uh, good. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a great thing. Yeah. And uh, in fact, you know, it's funny that uh, Joe Askren, who's on our faculty, a dream of his and all of ours is if we get a chance to expand one of these days and, and uh, our facilities, uh, we want to have a dedicated incubator where, where we could provide that kind of an ability for people to come in and do testing, whether it's opening a new place or whether it's revising a menu, very hard to test stuff in the middle of operations in, in a restaurant. It is. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that, that was kind of, you know, that's a really, that's an interesting concept. I'd love to talk with you more about that. Okay. We will. Yeah. That's All a right. Great, another, yeah. another person from group A, anybody else group? B? Yeah. Casey. So uh, my question is what advice could you give to like a student that's an aspiring entrepreneur that would like to maybe open their own restaurant someday? Um, just like what advice could you give to them? So uh, one thing I would suggest is, have you worked in a restaurant? I'm assuming you're talking about yourself. Yeah. Um, and and um, well, one thing I would suggest is really go to school on a successful restaurant. And particularly, uh, this is going to sound kind of funny, but uh, I think a chain restaurant. And the reason I say that is uh, because usually they have really good systems. And entrepreneurs typically, in my experience, have great ideas real passion, they'll push the execution part, but where they sometimes struggle is on the systems. Mm -hmm. And so I would really, uh, and if you're working in a restaurant now, I would really make sure that you're availing yourself of the opportunity to learn more about how they actually run it. So that's one thing I would say. Um, the other is, uh, and this is really funny because I was a corporate guy my whole life until 2004. And, uh, it's a really difficult path. You need to be, you need to really be sure that's what you want to do. And I'm, I mean, I don't say this to discourage, 
I'm saying this to encourage uh, because uh, I think it's a wonderful thing, but, uh, but it's difficult and uh, you need to really have resolve. You need to be sure it's what you want to do. And then uh, I've heard something years ago said, when you are developing your idea, don't listen to too many people because you have the idea of what you want to do. Don't listen to too many people. He said, but the minute you open your doors, listen to everybody. <laughs> and, and the example, the example that this particular person gave was that uh, when they were first working on the Mac, um, they knew what they wanted to do. And what they thought they wanted to do was compete on the basis of spreadsheets and word processing, et cetera, with, you know, uh, the DOS based uh, computers. Uh, what they found when they started listening was that people loved the graphics and the illustration capabilities that Mac had that others didn't. So they really pretty quickly said, okay, we're going to be happy with just adequate spreadsheets and word processing. We're really going to work on illustration. And so you really have to kind of think through, you know, like I'll give you an example in bricks. Uh, if you go to Texas and particularly central Texas and look for barbecue places, you rarely see sit down restaurants. It, what's full service. What you see is you go through the line and it's kind of a fast casual approach. You get served up and then you go sit down and eat. And so I was looking to be really authentic. You know, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to do because I'm going to bring them the real thing by God. Well, at the very beginning, we had people walking in and say, I'm going to stand in line. And they just walk over, sit down at the table and said, send a server over here. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm thinking to myself, wait, that's not the concept. <laughs> well, it became the concept pretty quickly. <laughs> so yeah. I would say, you know, be, be, have resolve in what you're trying to accomplish. And the minute you open up, start listening to everybody, so you can start fine tuning. So there are two of them. Great, great advice. Yeah. yeah. yeah uh, Brooke, that. you have I anything before? Too. I'm sorry, uh, Casey, go I ahead and say it again. Saying, I love going to Bricks. My boyfriend and I go there and eat all the time. So. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. That's why you have that glow, Casey. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, Brooke, do you have anything before I open it up? I have questions here from the audience. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering, do you plan on continuing to build restaurants and specifically in Sarasota? Uh, I don't, you know, I don't have a plan to do that, but it's in my mind. I, I think um, this whole COVID thing has given us all a bit of a, you know, a, a curveball. And so uh, uh, we're still trying to sort our way through it and to see where it's going to go. I mean, even now it's getting worse. So you're starting to hear about lockdowns again. And so, you know, that's got to be in the back of your mind. All that said, I'm kind of an optimist at heart. And I think we're going to get it under control. And by this time next year, I think the outlook's going to be a little bit different. And I think um, uh, both Bricks and Classico have some potential. And so we're, our whole goal now is let's really tight, continue to tighten up and get better at what we do so that if we do see an opportunity to grow, we'll be ready to do it and have the right people. I mean, it's always about building bench strength and having people so if you can grow, you can really, you know, have the people to do it. So the answer is yes, although I wouldn't call it a plan. It's sort of a thought at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Dick. Uh, before I have some questions too, but I don't want to horn in on the students because that's why we're here for the students. And uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them is from um, uh, uh, Dr. Adam Carmer, who is on our faculty. And Adam actually uh, worked many, many years in restaurants. Uh, and he writes, uh, what a wonderful share, Dick, thank you. What are some potential new positions students may look at moving forward? Wow. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but um, so if you mean like what, what direction might the industry be taken that would create more opportunities? So Adam, why don't you answer that in the chat and uh, while I go to the next question and then you tell us in the chat what, what you, uh, you know, a little bit more specifically what you meant. The other question, uh, Dick, is uh, if you were to outline the top three skills for a student to be successful in the restaurant industry, what would they be? Wow. Top three skills. I think you've actually talked about it already, but go ahead. So, um, you know, I think uh, I keep coming back to this character thing, but I'll put it in the context of more actionable kinds of things. Um, I think it's important to be genuine. And that's not a skill. It's a trait. But, but, it, but, but the way it would translate into behavior might be, to really sort of drive to do the right things and to do them well. Uh, so, uh, and again, that's 
not a skill per se, uh, but it starts to get at how you think about the business and how you organize your days and how you start with sort of the first things first, starting with your priorities in mind. And so I guess that would sort of lead you to uh, working with a purpose and really thinking through what is it I'm really trying to accomplish here? And so what steps am I gonna take today in order to move me forward? So that's one. I think, um, I think just learning to deal with people. So, and I think that is about um, remembering to sort of put yourself in the other person's seat to think about both. So remember when I talked about franchisees and pardon me, and franchisors. And um, I knew uh, that from the very beginning, we were trying to grow, we couldn't grow Applebee's without having successful franchisees. We didn't have the capital to grow it on a company owned basis. So we had to have franchisees if we were gonna grow. We were not gonna have franchisees unless they were successful. So that meant you better listen and find out what they were, what success means to them and how you can help, it, help them achieve it. And so I think, uh, leadership comes down to that to a certain degree too, is figure out what that other person's goals are, what they're trying to accomplish and how in the context of working in your environment, you can help them get what they are trying to get done, whether it's personal growth, whether it's financial, uh, whatever the case might be. So those are two, um, dealing with people, both guests and employees. Uh, and I think I touched on that in the sense of looking for the best in people and finding it. Um, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. I think uh, particularly in today's environment that seems to be in short supply. Uh, we're always questioning each other's motives. And so uh, I, I think that's important. Uh, and then I think just mastering the craft. I don't know how else to say it, but you, you have to know the basics of the business front and back. So um, you gotta know the kitchen back forwards and backwards. You gotta understand what makes it work, how you make money. You have to know the front of the house backwards and forwards not because you're going to do it all, but, but so you can lead effectively. And so just uh, the skill would be technical competence or technical skills at a high level. You know, Dick, that, that, is, that answer is absolutely fascinating because uh, uh, before I came over here, uh, uh, my last thing I did at UNLV was to help them write a strategic plan for the food service part of the program. And we asked people, in industry, we ask the Dick Rivera's of the world and the operators of the world, what, what, what would you want? What do you want to see in our school? And uh, they gave the same answer you just gave. And, but sometimes they forgot to talk about operations. They just assumed we were teaching everybody operations and food and everything, and we do here. Uh, but there had been an argument going on at the time on whether we should stay involved in teaching our students about operations. And I think you just answered my question. <laughs> The, the <laughs> others are, are, are critical. Yeah, team building yeah. and leadership and all that stuff. You know? Adam just responded to me uh, and he says, um, uh, yeah, a, a, a new jobs that uh, due to the new reality caused by COVID, any new positions that we didn't have before. That's what he was talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, that's interesting. I, I probably should be thinking more about that, but frankly, I've been, I've been furiously swimming against the current here. Uh, but I'm just thinking about our business and what we've had to do. And so I, I wouldn't think about necessarily new jobs uh, as I have the dimensions, how the dimensions of the job have changed and being willing to think about things that you might not have thought about before. Um, and, um, and so, so I, you know, I think for example, we've always had a, a to-go business. Um, this, is, this is not really answering the question, but in a way maybe it is. Um, we've always had a to-go business, but now it's like vital. And so how do you, how do you create, so we had to create positions so we could make that more uh, user-friendly and more effective. So make it really easy for the guests to use this, curbside service, delivery, et cetera. And how do we make sure we have somebody there bagging things properly and making sure the accuracy of the order is there? Those are fundamentals for somebody that's in the fast food business, but they weren't such a big deal for us because it was only three or 4% of our business. Now it's 20 to 25%. And so it hasn't been about new positions per se as about thinking a little bit differently about what we're doing and what we need to do to first get through and then thrive. Uh, Dick, I, I just wanna probe on one um, comment you made earlier, which is something that I think about a lot. Uh, and you, you were at a much different scale from what I am, but. You know, both as a manager for me and academics as well as in, in the industry, 
you talked about people decisions and that that headhunter that the, whatever the hell he was the uh, right headhunter recommended to you that you don't you don't dilly dally with those decisions and as you thought about that i mean is, so did it cut both ways dilly dally or or may put the other way make the decision quickly on who uh, has to go and then on who has to come in or you think you were leaning one way or the other or not somebody's not performing get rid of them or do you purposely go look for people and 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 uh, find people that can enhance the organization so i think first i'd say that some people are better at that than others and I, I don't think it's been a strength of mine i think if i over the course of my career if i've tended to err i've tended to err on waiting too long um so that's one um two uh, I do think that the, the other thing that happens is sometimes a job chews people up. So you might have two or three people that try to have a go at it and they can't do it. I think then you really need to think through what's wrong with the way this job is structured. Yeah. Or is there something wrong with the way this job is structured? Because it's just chewing through people that you thought were good. You know, when you put them in there, you say, oh, they can do this. Uh, and yet they're not able to. And you have to take them out and put somebody else in. But again, I'll go back to Drucker. He says the highest... The highest responsibility of a person in a leadership position is to remove ruthlessly was the word he used from office. Anyone who fails to perform with high distinction. Well, I read that a long time ago and I've never forgotten it. And um, and he didn't say take them out back and shoot them like I did. <laughs> he said uh, he said, look, if you made a mistake putting somebody in the position and they're really a good person, a good have been a good performer and they just can't do it now but get them out of there and then figure out what you're going to do with them, but put somebody in there that can do it. That's what he was talking about. But he said, but you have to, that's, I mean, and, and when I talked about uh, being the COO at Darden leading presidents of concepts, as opposed to leading a concept, the, the, the principle is basically the same, but you know, if you're not really running it, the only thing you can do is make the expectations and the, and the results that you're looking for clear and hold people accountable, give them the help they need. Say if somebody needs resources or whatever, give them what they need and then hold them accountable. And, and uh, the larger the organization, the longer you wait, the worse the consequences. So if you're sailing a Hobie cat, for some of you who might be boaters, if you're sailing a Hobie cat and you catch a little wind and you capsize, you just stand on one end, grab the line and pull it back up, you're back on the boat and off you go. If you're running a 100 foot yacht, and you capsize, now you got a problem on your hands. <laughs> the bigger the organization, Good analogy. <laughs> yeah, the longer you wait, the tougher it is to fix, you know? Good analogy. Well, listen, students and audience, I uh, just want to thank you all, students, for being here. I know some of you have to go to another class. And Dick, I'm going to ask you to remain just for one more question. But students, if you have to click out, we get it. We understand. We know that. It's a quick question. Uh, so students, just to, for those of you who do have to go now, next week's speaker is, uh, wait a minute, get my sheet here, is Ken Edwards of TriStar Hotels. He's also on our board of advisors and he's, uh, he's uh, CEO of TriStar. It's a company that owns hotels and manages hotels. Uh, and Ken was a former student of mine many, many years ago at UNLV and he just got his master's degree with us as he begins, gets ready for his third career. So um, Ken will be on next week and I'll, I'll post the information for you to look up on him. My last question to you, Dick, and this is a tough question. I, I, I apologize in advance, but what motivates you after doing all you've done? Amazing, both, both organizations, you know, the Restaurant Association, your businesses, big companies, small companies, what motivates you to keep doing what you're doing right now? Why, why do you open these new restaurants? I'm just curious. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll relay a, just a brief conversation I had with Leslie, who I think you've met. She said, you know, yeah. uh, when, I, when I left Darden, she said, you know, you're on my time now. You know, I waited all these years and we traveled all around the country. Said, this is my time when I was talking about opening bricks. And I said, well, I said, uh, you know, some guys, when they get to be my age, buy boats, buy airplanes, some guys get in the cars. Some guys get into women. I said, I'm in the restaurants. And she said, okay. She said, you can do your restaurant. I said, but here's the deal. You can do it as long as it doesn't interfere with our travel schedule. <laughs> well, that's a wise woman. 
So, yeah, yeah. so I've had to find a way to compromise, you know, to be able to do it. It's what I like doing. I like being in the restaurants. I like talking to the employees. I like talking to the guests. It's what I like doing. And, uh, uh, but, you know, you got to have a life too beyond yeah. that. And so we do. I'm with you, brother. I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you. I, you know, I, I think those of us who are passionate, I'm as passionate now about teaching as I, as I was 45 years ago. And uh, I'm lucky to, to, to have it. You know? yeah. Well, Dick, thank you. Don't go away. After the students leave, I have a favor to ask of you. It's not okay. as money. Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you for money. <laughs> and, Let me just uh, say thanks to the students. Okay. And uh, Bo, did you have a question?